All right, it is good to be here at Rose Park Baptist Church, and uh, we have been here before. Uh, Rose Park and our family go back a little ways. Um, it's kind of interesting. I, I feel at home here in a way. Uh, it's kind of neat to think back on uh, a lot of different things that have happened in the past. My, um, I grew up in South Carolina, and my mom grew up in South Carolina, but she met a young man in college that grew up in Finville, Michigan. Does anybody know where Finville, Michigan is? Okay, good. I think you probably do. And uh, so it's kind of interesting. I grew up in South Carolina, and I met a young lady at college that grew up in Holland, Michigan. And uh, it's kind of neat how uh, things happen. I think the Lord uh, put that together. And so it's kind of neat to come back here and to be in this area. I have been in Holland, Michigan uh, since I was a little child uh, growing up here. And so I still do get lost in Holland. I don't know. There's something about the Michigan turns on 31 that just messed me up. I don't know that there's any other place in America that does that, but uh, you guys are unique, and uh, so enjoy that a lot. Uh, but we, uh, we have enjoyed uh, just getting to know uh, some folks here this morning, and we've, uh, we've seen you uh, here in the past. We've, uh, we've borrowed your parking lot a few times. Uh, I appreciate that. Brother Schreier has put a little plug back there that helps us out occasionally. And uh, so we uh, have really enjoyed that as well, and I uh, get to know some folks here. We had a great week at Harbor Light Baptist Church, and uh, it's exciting to see what God is doing there, and we're, uh, we're thankful for what Rose Park is doing to, to help in that ministry. Uh, that is what it's all about, folks. It is about uh, planning churches, seeing people saved, and uh, putting the gospel out in needy areas. And uh, I want to commend you for that. I appreciate uh, that, uh, that ministry there and for what you've done. We've known the Myrings for quite some time. In fact, Brother Myring married my wife and I 17 years ago. Yes, so it'll be 18 in, in December. I got that right, okay? I'm, I'm, eating, I'm eating lunch, right? Okay, all right. Uh, 17 years ago, and uh, so uh, we, we have uh, had a good friendship with them for quite some time, and uh, we do appreciate uh, what, uh, what they're doing. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I was thinking a little bit about uh, some of the trials that uh, we face and experience in life this past week, and maybe some in this room this morning are going through some trials and struggles. And probably uh, everybody in this room somehow, some way, have had some struggles this week. If you haven't, you're lying to yourself. Let's just be honest. And uh, we've, uh, we've experienced some trials and struggles in our life, and uh, some people uh, kind of wonder about our ministry and our life and how we do certain things. And they say, well, what do you do in the middle of the wintertime? That's a trial. As an evangelist, you go to different places uh, across the country, and probably you don't go up into the cold areas in the wintertime. No, actually we do. Um, some people think that evangelists all go to Florida during the holiday time, but that's not true. Uh, we've been down to 18 below zero in an RV. That gets exciting. Uh, that gets real exciting when pipes start to freeze and all kinds of things happen. Uh, when you have ice on the inside of the windows, that's usually not a good sign. And uh, I remember being in, in Wyoming one time, the wind was just howling, and I mean, you opened up the door and, and immediately just feel the uh, below zero temperature just drift through. It doesn't drift through, it, it just kills you literally when you open that door. And uh, so, well, you know, some people say, what are you going to do in the, in the springtime, Right? Say you're in Kansas. Guess where we were this past April? We were in Kansas doing revival meetings. Some people ask, well, what are you going to do? Uh, what's your plan? You know, Kansas, I mean, that's Tornado Alley. That's, that's, uh, that's a really bad place to be in a mobile home, by the way. That's like a big target on your back, you know, for a tornado. And here's my plan. I am going to uh, hook up my truck to my trailer. I'm going to make a beeline for Soldier Field in Chicago. I'm going to park my trailer in the end zone because I hear... There are never any touchdowns there, so that's my plan, and um, you, you laugh. You, you laugh at me. I don't know why. Having lived in uh, Indiana for quite some time before evangelism, uh, our allegiances are with a certain team in Indianapolis, uh, and uh, we have enjoyed that. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, if you can, out of respect for God's Word, if you're able to stand, I want to read through a few verses this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And verse number one. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. 
And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring you liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will abide, yea, in winter with you, that you may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. Now, verses 1 through 8 are very interesting verses. What is he doing? He is giving you an itinerary of what he has done and what he is going to be doing, where he is heading. Uh, he's just basically giving you a very clear itinerary. You know what? I, I, it's much like an evangelist. I could tell you some of the itineraries of different places that we have been over the last few weeks. And we've been in Colorado doing vacation Bible schools, in Wyoming, and in Utah, and, and in Kansas, and in Indiana. And, and he's just basically giving us that concept as well. But he changes the whole dynamic of the conversation in verse 9. He says, For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and I have many friends. Is that what he says? No. And he says what? He says, and there are many adversaries, right? Did, did you hear that word? Adversaries. And this morning, if you do a ministry for Jesus Christ as a Christian, and you desire to serve Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you are going to experience some hindrances and adversaries in your path. And probably this week, I would gather that there are maybe a few in this room who have experienced some hindrances in your spiritual walk or some hindrances in serving Jesus Christ this past week. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but probably there would be many, many hands that would be raised this morning if we were to be honest. I want to speak to you this morning on hindrances in ministering for Jesus Christ. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we pray for your word this morning that it would be very clear and very precise to each individual that is here. And Lord, I pray that we would not walk out of here the same way in which we have come in, but that we would walk out of here having done business with you, making change in our life, and better ready to serve you this week as a result of being here. Lord, I pray that your words would go forth very clearly, that your Holy Spirit would not just be present, but that your Holy Spirit would be paramount in our lives this morning. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Quite a few years ago, my family and I, and I want to introduce my wife. Is my wife back there? Let me have her wave, wave her hand so you kind of know who she is. She didn't wave it, she didn't wave it high enough. And uh, she, she is from Holland. She's her friend. All right. And... Um, we were, we were traveling from Georgia to Utah to do some meetings. It was in February, and uh, normally I don't do a straight shot from Georgia to Utah. We have some meetings in between, but that year it just so happens that it was that way. And I remember pulling out of there in February, and uh, it was a little chilly. But anyways, I thought, you know what, we got to stop and get some propane in our RV. And we stopped in Temple, Georgia, got some propane, went on our way. And uh, as we were headed across uh, Mississippi and Alabama, Mississippi, we got into Arkansas, decided to stop, and we were doing some straight shots. We were doing some big jumps because we had a long way to go. And... Um, I remember going into, uh, after we got some gas there again, we pu pulling into a truck stop, going into the trailer, and I hear this annoying beeping sound. And I'm thinking, oh, this is not good. What's going on? So I went uh, looking around for this beeping sound. Have you ever been in one of those places, you know, where you think, oh, no, it's, uh, it's the kid's room. It's got to be the kid's room. One of those annoying toys that grandparents give. <laughs> got to be careful, mother-in-law's here. But anyway, it's one of those annoying toys. I thought, you know, it's got to be in there. It was not in there. Uh, went into the bedroom. It's got to be an old watch of mine. It wasn't in the bedroom. Finally, I go, and there it is. It's right in front of me. It was a refrigerator, and uh, the refrigerator is making this annoying beeping sound. If you've ever been in an RV refrigerator, they're kind of unique. Uh, they, uh, they use propane to heat an element to cool things. I don't understand it, but that's what happens. And uh, so it was uh, an interesting little diagram on top, and there was this code that said E7 or E8 or something like that. And I thought, well, what is that? I've seen the A1, A2, and A3, which usually meant the pilot light had burnt out or something like that. Never seen an E as an error code. Got out the manual and said, seek professional help immediately. That's not good. <laughs> okay. So I pull into a camping world in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I go in there and I said, hey, can you diagnose the problem? They went out. Uh, charged me 50 bucks to diagnose a problem. Tell me that my circuit board on the refrigerator was done. And you need a brand new circuit board. It's going to cost me $800. I said, you know what? Let's go ahead and let's buy a brand new refrigerator for $800. Show us what you have. 
He walked us back to the back of that building there and he showed us seven or eight different refrigerators. We have five kids and we want a large refrigerator. What do you have in that category? He said, well, I have a seven cubic foot. I said, oh boy, the one we have now is eight cubic foot. My wife, she says, "Uh uh-uh. We're not going smaller. We've got to go bigger. Well, anyways, to make a long story short, I, uh, I looked at that and I thought, well, you know what we're going to do is all the way to Utah, we are going to make the trailer as cold as possible so we don't have to buy all kinds of new condiments and different things, refrigerated stuff, whatnot. And we're going to live in the semi-truck, okay? We pull with a semi-truck and we're going to kind of sleep in it. And, we, you know, we got two more nights of this and we're just going to, we're going to hunker down in the semi-truck and live in it and make the trailer as cold as possible, drain the water lines, everything, you know, and it was cold. And uh, that way, uh, you know, I'll get... Uh, Utah, I'll figure out the refrigerator problem. And so, um, sure enough, we, uh, we decided to do that. So I go back into the trailer, and I'm kind of uh, buttoning up the hatches and everything, and, and I look over to the side. Uh, above, the, uh, above the couch is a, uh, a window, a large window there, and uh, there's a spidery look behind the blind. And I thought, well, what's going on with that? Pull up the blind. Uh-oh, we got a problem. The window has been shattered. Some truck along the way has stirred up a rock and it has shattered that window. And so, you know what I did? I said, well, where's the duct tape? You know, I'm from South Carolina. That's what we do. We just duct tape things up. Little cardboard here and there. You know what? I thought, well, this is interesting. I've got a broken refrigerator, Lord. Now I've got a broken window. We're going to look like gypsies for Jesus driving down the road. But anyways, that's all right. And you know, it's, uh, so I'm thinking, we're, we're just going to get to Utah. Lord, I just want to get to Utah. I remember uh, later that night, we're out there in the middle of Oklahoma, just got through Oklahoma City. We're doing one of those all-nighters, and I'm driving away, uh, drinking, uh, drinking the coffee and Mountain Dew and all those different things to try to keep myself stirred and awake. And all of a sudden, in the middle of my lane is this deer. You ever been there, right? Well, this deer wasn't moving because it had already been hit, Could not move over, could not move over here. Other vehicles are there, and I'm thinking, this is not good. Well, brace for impact. Here we go, you know. And I held on uh, as best as I could to that uh, that steering wheel, and sure enough, there goes the deer, and, and then I'm looking at my truck I'm okay with. My trailer is a little older. I'm thinking, this is not good. I watch the trailer do this number in the mirror, you know, up and down, pull off to the side. I'm thinking, whoa, what damage have we done? Everything looked okay, but now I have deer all over the front of my trailer. I've got a broken refrigerator. I've got a a broken window. It's all cardboard up and duct taped together. I've got deer all over the front of my trailer. Lord, I just want to preach for you, you know? And I'm thinking that. Get into Mexico around 5, 5 5.30 in the morning. I've got to get some sleep. And you know what, uh, I pull the blinds in the truck there, everybody's uh, sacked out, and I'm just like, I gotta get an hour or so, I'm in a Walmart parking lot, and uh, I fall asleep, drift off, and all of a sudden I hear this. I'm thinking, who in the world is knocking on my truck window in a Walmart parking lot at this early in the morning? What in the world's going on? So I open up the blinds there, I look, and it's not anyone knocking on the window. It was sleet pellets that were hitting the window. This is not good. Got out the radar on the little phone there, you know. I'm thinking, oh, I can drive through this. I can get out of this. We have got to move. Pull everything up, you know, get, get everything together. We get back on the highway, and I'm driving along on I-40. I am trying to just keep attentive. Sleet is coming down, and we're going to drive out of this, though, you know, and everything is going to be just fine. And all of a sudden, in front of us, I see cars doing strange things, you know. They're doing things in medians. I know that vehicles are not supposed to be in the median on an interstate. And they're going backwards down the median. Now, that's not a good sign. You know what? It's interesting. I just kind of knew this. Don't panic. Don't brake. Take your foot off the accelerator and coast and see if you can get through it. And sure enough, you know what? Somehow God was able to move vehicles around and we narrowly escaped a, a, near, a very bad disaster. We get on into Utah. We get there to this meeting. And uh, the pastor says, he says, well, he says, uh, we got a problem. I said, what's that? He said, half the church is sick. Now, when you're in a small church in Utah and half the church is sick, that means there's not going to be many people there. I'm thinking, Lord, you just put me through all that to come to this church, and I'm going to be preaching to, to, to a bunch of, of chairs. Well, what's going on here, Lord? I'm thinking all these strange things like, Lord, what is your purpose here? And he said, well, you know what? We're going to have a meeting anyway. So, you know what? I just make plans, make provisions, get ready. And you know what? Right around, uh, I remember that, that night, we were getting ready to start this evangelistic meeting. And I didn't think there was going to be a whole lot of people there. Uh, right around 4 o'clock, it starts to snow. And it starts to snow. And you know a little bit about snow around here, right? I mean, it was one of those. I mean, it was coming down about an inch or two every, every hour. And uh, right around 6 o'clock, I mean, the whole patio and parking lot was covered in snow. And I'm thinking, great. Now nobody's coming. It was amazing, though, uh, that that night as uh, the pastor shows up, he's got five young teenage boys. 
that he has been working with at a charter school, being a substitute teacher at a charter school, and he's been working with them. And I look at him and I said, you know what, I'm going to change my message. I've got to change my message because this is Tina. He said, no, 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 no. We plan on a prophecy conference, evangelistic crusade and whatnot. You, you just go ahead and preach what you're planning on doing. Okay, all right, fine. I'm preaching these messages and I know that everything is flying over their heads. And you know what's amazing? God is good because that night four of those five young men walked back to the back and accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. You will face hindrances and adversaries in ministry, but our God is greater. You know, it's amazing too that next night, uh, the, f- the fifth boy that, uh, that did not accept that first night, he came and he accepted Christ as a Savior. The next night, he brought his grandmother. She accepted Christ as her Savior. The next Sunday, uh, a lady came in uh, and she was uh, an unchurched lady, LDS, and uh, she had uh, been thinking about uh, Jesus Christ, the true Jesus Christ of the Bible. And she heard the message. She accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior. And you know what? It went from there. Her husband, a month later, God kept working in that church. Our God is greater. You may face hindrances and you may face adversaries, but our God is greater than any hindrance and any adversary that you will ever face, Christian. And here, I believe the Apostle Paul understands a little bit about hindrances and adversaries. This is a man that was beaten. This is a man that was stoned and left for dead. This is a man that how, I don't know how many different murderous mobs tried to kill him. This is a man who was shipwrecked several times. This is a man that knows a little bit about hindrances and adversaries. And he says, for a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries in this passage. You know, maybe he is referring to uh, uh, some of the different uh, Colosseum uh, games that would take place where uh, he says a great door. They would open up the great doors there of the Colosseum and uh, the different uh, crusaders would go in and they would do battle in that Colosseum, uh, the different races and the different challenges that would take place. I don't know exactly specifics here, but he's saying, you know what, there's a great door Uh, effectual, open for me, a lot of opportunity, but he says there are going to be some adversaries in my life as I go and minister and serve Jesus Christ. You know, some, what are some of the hindrances that we face? You know, I cannot preach this message without preaching the first hindrance is that of Satan himself, isn't it? Satan does not want Rolls Park Baptist Church to succeed. Satan does not want Rose Park Baptist Church to reach young people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was exciting for me this morning to sit in your foyer and see your pastor drive up in a bus. How about that? That was neat. You know, Satan doesn't want young people to get on a bus and come to church. Satan does not want young people to come to vacation Bible school. Satan does not want adults to hear the gospel at a church such like this. Satan does not want, he does not want your choir to be a a wonderful choir. He does not want it to happen. He does not want your teen ministry to be a thriving teen ministry. He does not want your senior saints ministry to be a thriving senior saints ministry. Satan wants to destroy this church. He does not want it to succeed. And likewise, he wants to destroy you, Christian, And I know, and you know this verse as well, 1 Peter 5, 8. What does it say? It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He does not merely want to trip you. He does not merely want to harm you. He wants to destroy you, Christian. And he will do whatever he can to destroy you. You know what, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I was thinking about this a while back. Why does Satan so oppose us? Why does he so oppose a Christian that wants to serve their Savior? Well, I was thinking about it a little bit more and more. I thought, well, because we as Christians, we are infringing upon his domain and territory uh, because those that have given allegiance to him, they serve their Savior. But as we go out and we serve our Savior and tell people about Jesus Christ, we are stealing from his family. You say, well, how is that? How can he have a family? John chapter 8 and verse 44 says, Year of your father the devil, the lust of your fathers ye will do. And we are uh, really infringing upon his family. You say, well, how is that? How can he have a family? Well, Jesus talks about the family of God. And he also alludes to the fact that Satan has a family as well. And if you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, you are not a part of the family of God. You are a part of Satan's family, and Satan does not want you to hear the message of the gospel. Well, it is so simple and so clear. And that gospel message goes on and on forever and forever, and it will go on forever. And it is a wonderful truth that Jesus Christ did come to this earth, and he did die on the cross for you and for me, and we deserve punishment. But what did he do? He took our punishment on that cross. 
by his mercy he has saved us. By his grace he has saved us. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 18, we as Christians are to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sin. And we are living in a world today where there are so many people that are blinded by Satan. I see that every single year we go out to Utah. I love Utah. A variety of different reasons why God has led us into a ministry of Utah. And I believe as best as we can, we're going to go into Utah every single year that we can. We spend quite a bit of time there. And there are some people in that state that are tragically blinded to the true Jesus Christ that we do serve. And it happens even here in Holland, Michigan. There are people that are blinded to the true gospel, the message of the gospel and the true Jesus. And Satan has blinded them as he describes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Paul also said this. He said, wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. He talks to the Thessalonican church. He says, we would have come to you sooner, but Satan hindered us. You know that word hindered in that passage means to break up the road. If you want to look at it literally, Paul is saying somehow, some way, Satan broke up the road in front of us and we would have come to you sooner. Satan is going to do whatever he can to stop this church and to stop Christians from serving their Savior and putting the gospel out. And maybe Satan has gotten the better of you. Maybe Satan has given you an excuse. Well, I can't go and give the gospel because I'm not an eloquent speaker. You know what? Uh, There was another man named Moses who wasn't an eloquent speaker, and God used another man named Aaron to be his voice. There's always a way to get the gospel out, and he wants you to be a part of it. He doesn't want you to sit on the sidelines. He wants you to get involved. He wants you to serve him with all that you have. I love 1 John in verse 4. It says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Satan is not going to win in the end. Jesus Christ is the victor. We are on the victorious side. And we will do battle with Satan, and we will also do battle with self. Have you ever felt that this morning? Maybe when you woke up this morning, you... uh, You stretched your legs, you put your feet to the ground, and all of a sudden things begin popping in your back, and you all of a sudden feel the muscles that are not moving like they should, you know, and and self is going to get the better of you. Self is going to say, you don't need to go to church this morning. Self is going to say, you don't need to to serve your Savior this morning because, you know, what? you've got all kinds of other excuses as to why you don't need to be here. And, and you know, what? your flesh is going to do whatever it can to stop you from serving your Savior. That's a hindrance, isn't it? You know what, um, part of yourself is your flesh. You must fight your flesh. Your flesh does not want you to minister. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Your flesh wants you to live for the here and the now and for this world. And Have you ever thought about the value of the eternal soul, however? The value of an eternal soul. And some people say, well, you know what? Uh, You as an evangelist, you go out in some of those areas that are rural, the highways and hedges, as I put it, and why don't you target the metro areas? Let me say this. There are some needs in some of the highways and hedges out there too. And they say, well, it's not a good return on investment, but there have been so many people that we have seen accept Jesus Christ as their Savior who maybe would have never accepted, but yet somebody came alongside and told them the true message of the gospel. The value of an eternal soul. God wants us to tell people about who he really is. You know what? Uh, Paul had a burden for his own people. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. You know what? Paul had a problem with his own flesh, his own body. We don't know exactly what it was. But he asked God several times to remove it. But God said, no, my grace is sufficient for thee. He battled his flesh every single day. He went out. He was striving to reach his country, his culture with the gospel of Jesus Christ every single day. Paul fought his flesh every single day. Part of yourself is your fears. You've got to fight your fears too. You've got to understand your fears. Satan wants to scare you into not ministering for him. Remember when I was growing up, when I was a teenager, my pastor, and I was talking with Pastor Smith earlier today about uh, my home church that I grew up in, Emmanuel Baptist Church of Taylor, South Carolina, and I had a pastor named Marshall Shannon, big guy, really big guy. 
And uh, he was a dear friend to me, still is to this day. And uh, he came to me one time. He said, Richard, he said, we got to have somebody to speak at the nursing care facility on Monday night. Tomorrow night, you got to be ready. I thought, okay. All right, I can do that. I can do that. And by the way, I'm not going to answer no to you because you will sit on me and break every bone in my body. He's a big guy, you know. He didn't say no to Marshall Shannon. He was the marshal, you know. And so uh, I was all ready to go. You know, I had my three-point outline. I had my little poem, and I am as scared as de- to death. I'm 15 years of age. This is one of the first times I'm ever going to preach, you know. And I'm thinking, well, I'm going to be okay, though. You know, we're going to have revival in the nursing care facility. And people are going to be walking down the aisle. Well, they'll be rolling down the aisle and accepting Christ. But anyways, you know, they're, they're, we're going to have revival. And so I would go in there, and we sing our little hymns and different things. I get up to speak, and I'm preaching away. I mean, I mean, just doing what I, I thought we needed to do, you know, and uh, get to point number two. And in the middle of my message, point number two, some dear lady in the back corner, she just yells and screams to the top of her lung, Will somebody please scratch my back? I mean, it totally messed me up and threw me into next week. And I'm sitting there thinking, where, what point was I on, let alone where am I? I didn't know where to start. I didn't know where to begin again. And I walked out of there thinking, boy, I tell you what, you know, if, if that's what preaching is all about, I'm never going to preach again. You know, I, I am scared now of some dear little lady that wants her back scratched. We get scared of the strangest of things, don't we? And we use the strangest of things as excuses to not serve our Savior. Fight your fears. Fight your failures. You've ever failed in ministry? Raise your hand if you've ever failed in ministry. Everybody in this room should be raising your hand. You've messed up. I've messed up. I was thinking about this this morning, San Francisco just got hit by an earthquake. I was thinking of a church I was at in Antioch, California quite a few years ago. The pastor called me up. He says, I want you to uh, uh, preach for our missions conference. Usually we have it during the Thanksgiving week. And so if you can have a missions related type message each night and uh, also, it's Thanksgiving, so kind of put a little flavor of Thanksgiving in there. And by the way, you used to be involved in Christian schools. You used to be a school administrator, so go ahead and throw something in there about Christian school administration. And, and by the way, could you do a prophecy conference along with this? And I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm spinning around like all these different topics and things, and I'm thinking, how is this going to work out? And Brother Mincy said, you can do it. I said, okay, all right. So I remember getting there late that Saturday night. And I remember he says, by the way, he says, I didn't tell you this, but we have two services. We have one at 8.30 in the morning, and then we have Sunday school at 9.30, and then we have a regular service at 10.30 because of the size of our buildings. We've got to split uh, services on Sunday morning and, of course, Sunday night message. I said, okay, fine. He said, if you'll go ahead and preach two different messages, and I'm thinking, okay, all right, I've got to put all this together. I've got uh, Christian education. I've got Thanksgiving. I've got missions. I've got prophecy conference. I've got all these different things that I've got to kind of hammer down, you know? And so, you know what, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just glad I even woke up at 8.30 in the morning to preach. I didn't even know that, that uh, you know, I'm not a morning person. But anyways, you know, at 8.30 in the morning, it's, at least it's an ungodly time to have a message or mess, have a service. It really is kind of weird to have one of those, you know, people are trying to, you know, just wake up a little bit. And they're sipping on the coffee at 8.30 in the morning. But it was what they had to do with their service and with their facility. And so, you know what, I'm, I'm kind of trying to get everything together and everything went well, went to the teen class, taught in the teen class for Sunday school and then go to the 1030 service and I mean, everything is going fine. I get up there to preach, you know, and, and uh, I, I feel like everything is going really well. Get done. People came to the altar. Some things were being done. I walked to the back by our little uh, display table. My wife meets me and she says, do you realize what you just said? When your wife says, do you realize what you just said? You know, you just said something really, really wrong. I said, well, honey, I, I thought everything, no, 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 no. Do you realize what you just said? I said, honey, I thought everything was fine, you know what I mean? And she said, when you prayed before you preached, you said this. She says, dear Lord, you said, dear Lord, I pray that these will be my words and not your words only. <laughs> now, you do understand that there are some theological problems with that prayer. And I thought to myself, well, if that is what I said, I am never going to pray before I preach again. Well, you know what? I just prayed before I preached. You know, you've got to fight your failure. Now, that may be something small and insignificant, but some of us, we have failed in ministry, and we use that as an excuse to not minister for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How many times have I heard excuse after excuse after excuse? Well, I can't do that because when I did it last time, boy, I tell you what, it was a mess. I, I, can't, I, can't, uh, I can't do that because, you know what, I, I just don't have the, the, the ability to do that. God wants to stretch you, maybe. He wants to grow you. He wants to change you. He wants to make you into something totally different that you thought you could never be. I want you to fight, he says, fight your failures. I believe the Apostle Paul, he had some failures, no doubt. 
He had some struggles. He had some fears, no doubt. He had uh, the flesh that he had to fight every single day. You've got to fight yourself every single day if you're going to serve. That is a hindrance. And finally, I want you to notice that sometimes saints can be a hindrance. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. Some people would speculate whether or not he was a believer. You know what? I'm not going to get out of the debate. But you know what? John Mark, as pastor was mentioning this morning in his Sunday school class, uh, was a disappointment somewhat to the Apostle Paul. And uh, he felt was a hindrance. And sometimes, you know what? Saints, we feel, can be hindrances. You ever seen that? I remember several years ago, I was at a church in Utah, and we were going in to do a vacation Bible school. And the pastor said, I'm just amazed that you're here. This is amazing that actually the church has asked you to come. He was excited, ecstatic. He said, let me just tell you a little bit about what happened. I said, okay. When they say that, that means this is going to be really interesting. Uh, what's going to happen next? He said, well, he said, you know, I had, a young, I had a man that was on fire for the Lord. He raised his hand, and he said, Pastor, I think we ought to have a vacation Bible school to reach some of these community kids. He said, I see them every single day. I knew a few of them, and we just don't have really a children's ministry. And, and he said, Pastor, I just really want to do that. And, of course, the pastor's moderating this, this meeting of around 10 or so people. You know, it's a small church. And, you know, he's sitting there, and he's saying, okay, all right, everybody in favor. And all of a sudden, you see hands start to raise. And this man, he has a dear concern for the young people in his community. And all of a sudden, some hands were being raised, and all of a sudden, somebody says, well, you know what, wait, 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 preacher, preacher. If we have vacation Bible school, then you know what is going to happen? We are going to have to come in after vacation Bible school, and we are going to have to clean the carpet of the church. Oh, by the way, somebody else raised their hand. Preacher, if, if we have vacation Bible school, you know what is going to happen? The kids are going to go into the bathroom and they are going to be using a whole bunch of paper towels and we're going to have to buy more paper towels in the bathroom. And you know, kids, uh, when they are uh, also doing the crafts, there's going to be paint all over the place and there's going to be glue everywhere. And you know as well, when they go into the bathrooms too, you know, kids always do this. No, kids don't get any ideas. Uh, you know, they go in there and, and they, uh, they, they go in and they go into the stalls, they lock the door and they crawl out underneath the stalls and we're going to have locked stalls in the bathrooms. We can't have vacation Bible school. That is a true story, folks. We come up with some of the strangest of reasons why we as a church shouldn't minister for Jesus Christ. Sometimes we saints are hindrances in serving our Savior. Because we like our church the way in which it is. We're comfortable where we are. We don't want it to change. And that church did not want, those people did not want a change to happen. And I, I remember hearing that pastor, he said, I watched that man that had a zeal for souls in that meeting. He was standing there and he was on fire for God. All of a sudden I saw him very, very quickly wilt to his seats because he thought, well, if the saints are going to be this way, then I might as well join them and give up. And saints sometimes can be a hindrance. Let me state this to you very clearly. We do not, we do not serve, serve saints. We serve our Savior. And our Savior wants us to serve Him with all that we have. And you know what? It's interesting. When you look at this, it reminds me of Revelation chapter 3 and verse 15. Many, many churches and many, many Christians are there. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Comfortable, complacent, easy. Don't bother me, crowd. Don't offend me, crowd. And if all goes well in church, then I will come. But you know what? I don't want to feel uncomfortable. God does not want us to be comfortable in church. He wants us to learn, and He wants us to grow. We have too many Christians that are just in our society wanting to be comfortable. Saints sometimes can be a hindrance. It reminds me of a young man named David. In 2 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 28, here David, he has been talking with God in the fields with his sheep. Here David, he has been singing the wonderful hymns of the Psalms to his sheep. He has been communing with God and then his father tells him to go and to spend some time with his brothers, take him some food down by the battlefront. He goes down by the battlefront and then of course uh, he meets up with his eldest brother Eliab in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 28 and Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men and Eliab's anger was kindled against David and he said, why camest thou down hither and with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride, the naughtiness of thine heart for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle and David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? 
Here his own brother is attacking him. Here his own brother uh, is saying, hey, you, know, you, you got some sheep to tend to. You got some other issues to take care of back at home. This is a battlefront. You let us boys, big boys, take care of it. You, young boy, you go on back home. David, he had been tuned into God and he said, well, is there not a cause here? What have I now done? He is not going to sit still and let the Goliath mock his God. What does he do? He goes down by that little creek. He picks up some pebbles. He gets that slingshot. He puts a pebble in that slingshot. He starts to wind that thing up, and he lets loose straight at Eliab, right? No, he didn't let loose at Eliab. No, he went out and fought the real fight. He focused upon what God had called him there to do. He fought Goliath. And we have in our society today many, many churches where saints are hindrances and our responsibility when we see that is to not fight the saints but to fight the true fight. If they want to be complacent where they are, let God deal with them. But you don't shrink down in your seat and give up. You continue serving. And we are to walk in Jesus Christ's footsteps, not in other saints' footsteps. Now, thankfully, there are some saints that God has used, and they are great role models and great examples. I think of the great David Livingston. I think of the Billy Sundays. I think of the D.L. Moody's. I think of the men that are out there that, that have been in the past that, uh, yes, serve God with all they have. But let me say this. I am following Jesus Christ, my Savior. David turned and fought the real fight. Saints can be hindrances. For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. There are many hindrances. Maybe this morning Satan has gotten the better of you and you've fallen into sin. Maybe this morning yourself has gotten the better of you and you've given up because it's just very difficult. Maybe this morning you've been looking at saints trying to follow after them, follow after Jesus Christ. I remember that one time, yes, we went through several obstacles. They were somewhat really insignificant in some situations' lives, some people's lives, but yet getting to a place in Utah to minister and my God was greater. Hindrances in ministry for Jesus Christ.